Hi, and welcome to SpondyCast, where we bring together the best medical minds, thought leaders, scientists, patients, and caregivers to inform and inspire the spondylitis community. I'm your host, Jill Miller, living my best spa life, knowing that how we meet today has the power to change everything going forward. Please note that the information provided in this podcast should not be considered medical advice. We do encourage all listeners to consult their healthcare professionals for medical concerns. Thank you for listening, and we hope you find our discussion today enlightening. Hi, and welcome to SpondyCast. Today, our guest is Nicole Mozafari. She has been a licensed physical therapist for five years, and she is currently employed with Kepros Physical Therapy in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Prior to working at Kepros, she completed her doctorate of physical therapy at St. Ambrose University in Davenport, Iowa. And following that program, she completed an orthopedic residency program and received her certificate in manual therapy, CMT, and orthopedic clinical specialty certification. She specializes in vestibular rehab, concussion, and headaches. Outside of her career, she enjoys running, camping, bird watching, gardening, and making sourdough with her husband, Ho Schwab. Well, Dr. Mozafari, we're going to talk today about, first, thank you for coming, but we're going to talk today about optimizing mobility and functionality. This is a big one for Spondy. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here. No, this is going to be exciting. So uh, let's dig into it. Tell us a little bit about how you became a physical therapist. Yeah. So when I was in my undergraduate education, I remember I stayed after one day talking to my organic chem professor and uh, he was like this old, you know, wise man. Uh, and I remember chatting with him saying I wanted to go into something healthcare related. And so he kind of encouraged me to look into physical therapy. I did an internship and then I kind of recognized it was like the perfect field for me because I loved healthcare. I really, really value relationships with people. And I loved that it included like problem solving where I just got to kind of pick apart different things and try to figure out what was going on and you're helping people at the end of the day. So I really thought it was a great fit for me. I love it. Um, We need more of you. Um, Oh, thank you. (laughs) So we, as you know, talk a lot about spondyloarthritis here. Mm -hmm. I, how does that affect functional, functional movement and mobility? For people. Mm-hmm. So what I tend to see with any sort of spondyl arthropathy or in many autoimmune diseases, you know, such as uh, like thyroid disease or other ones like that, we see the mobility be one of the things that's affected first and foremost. So my patients might come in complaining of a lot of, you know, joint stiffness um, and that joint stiffness can lead to, you know, pain, pain leads to, I don't really want to move my body. I don't want to move my body leads to functional deficits. So it might be, you know, in the morning, things are more flared up or uncomfortable and they might have a hard time getting in and out of bed or getting on and off the toilet or uh, getting up and getting ready for work, you know, things like that. And so we really do see that carryover from uh, mobility deficits to function. We see that overlap pretty big. So tell me a little, what is, how is a certified manual therapist different from physical therapy? Yeah. So I, when I was in my residency program, I took a series of courses where I learned more hands-on techniques. And so over the course of about a year, I just learned how to do more like joint mobilizations, um, soft tissue mobilizations, how to do more formal assessments on different joints. And so it was super helpful for kind of taking me a little bit further, especially being one year out from physical therapy school. Yeah. And is that like, are there some techniques that are more effective in treating people with spondyloarthritis? I definitely tend to get a really good assessment of what their soft tissue mobility feels like. So we're feeling things like, um, you know, you're feeling tendons, you're feeling their muscles and how the tone kind of feels in their muscles. Um, So I'm doing that type of assessment. And then you also want to feel their joint mobility too. So I might get on, you know, have them laying on their stomach and putting pressure through their spine to kind of assess how that moves. 
And I would say joint mobilizations along with the soft tissue mobilizations, those are the two things I probably use the most with my patients. Occasionally I'll use some dry needling or I might do like Graston, which is um, basically kind of like a metal tool where you can help um, improve blood flow and uh, reduce like tissue tone. Sometimes I'll do that as well. And I think those can be really helpful um, for people that have tissues that are inflamed. Yeah. So I think we often think of like our joints in spondylitis and mm -hmm. those getting inflamed, but yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about like what happens to the soft tissue? Like, yeah, absolutely. With spondylitis? Yeah. So one of the things I will ask my students um, or some of our newer PTs in our clinic is if a joint is in dysfunction, what else might be in dysfunction? And I always kind of describe it as like inflammatory soup. So if there's an area or a joint that's inflamed, so, you know, for me, it was my SI joints. I had discomfort in my glutes. I had discomfort in my lower back. Um, you know, I had discomfort kind of all around that, that area. And so essentially any tissue that crosses a joint can also become inflamed. If we think about an infl inflammatory soup kind of in that whole area. Did and so inflammatory soup. Inflammatory soup. Yes. That's what I, never call it. Heard that, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically just like anything that's in that localized area can be affected. Um, we see that all the time with a muscle that crosses a joint, that muscle can come and become dysfunctional if the joint is also dysfunctional. That's a, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I will tell you soup is my favorite food on earth. Almost every Same. Soup, clam chowder. Okay, yeah, so I'm out on that one too. soup, no. I know, I <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> I know, people are always like, what's your favorite food? I was like, soup. You know? Always. So, um, okay, so that's the certified manual therapy, but what about mm -hmm. the OCS? And how does that like influence your approach? Yeah, so the OCS, I basically, it's a, and it's an extra board exam essentially. So I studied for that while I was in residency and it, basically takes a diver deep into, or a deeper dive, I should say, into looking at each joint, discussing how to treat it, discussing pathologies that might be present in those different areas. And so that was very helpful, but I would say even more helpful was my residency program that I was in during that time. And essentially what we did was we talked about, we kind of have this little acronym, it's called SINS, um, but basically it stands for a couple of different words. And it's looking at what stage are they in, of the inflammatory cycle. Um, how long has it been present for? How intense are their symptoms? Is it easy to provoke symptoms and challenging to get them to go away? Or is it, you know, harder to provoke symptoms or maybe harder to get it to go away? And then we look at things, you know, such as what do we think it's coming from? Is it inflammatory, mechanical? Is it more of a, um, like a nerve issue? You know, you're looking at all those types of things. And I think when you look more at patients and think about their symptoms in that regard, it can really help you hone in on where you should start with therapy so that you don't do too much too quickly. What does SIN stand for? Stage intensity? Uh, so it's severity, irritability, nature, stage, and stability. Severity, irritability, nature, stage, and stability. Correct. I love that. Yeah. I love those kinds of like little hacks. I do too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you find that approach and the patient can probably also get behind it a little bit. Yeah. I think when you take the time to think about where they're at on that spectrum, you have a little bit better idea of where to start and you tend to not do too much too soon. And that's where I feel like patients have either, you know, dropped out of PT or been like, I don't want to come back, you know, because you do too much at once in the beginning, where a lot of times we just have to start a bit slower if there's an underlying autoimmune condition. Is there like a percentage rate of people who drop out? I don't have a number for you, um, but I definitely would say any patient that has chronic pain, I tend to be more cautious with when we start PT. Sure. And you just want to make sure that you're having really open communication about how they're feeling, how they respond to the exercises you give them or the treatment, um, because you just want to make sure that you're not causing these flare ups when they leave um, or the exercises aren't making them feel worse. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think many of us probably listeners have been there, right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Myself included for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Okay. So spondyloarthritis is a rheumatological condition Mm -hmm. and you have an orthopedic specialization as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you look at it through that lens, like what are the key components of a treatment plan Mm-hmm. for an individual? Like, what do you assess? Is it the SINs approach or are there other components? Yeah, so that's definitely included. So I really, I try to get a pretty hardy subjective, um, which that portion of our exam is just asking them a lot of questions about what they're coming in for. So typically someone will come in, if they have, you know, spondylitis, they might come in and say, well, I'm having more like SI joint pain or low back pain or hip pain or whatever that might be. And so I try to get a really hearty subjective asking them questions about how long has this been going on? Um, how well is a disease controlled right now? Because, you know, if they're coming in, they're saying I'm transitioning medications or right. I just got off my meds um, or, you know, I've been on my biologic for four months and I feel great. You know, that really can change the direction that you take things in. So I start with this objective understand where they're at in the inflammatory process. And then I typically move into a pretty thorough objective examination where that's where we're looking at strength. We're looking at range of motion. Um, we're, you know, palpating or feeling tissues to see what those feel like. Um, and so that's kind of the second portion. And then we get into some treatment and then some home exercises typically. And that is generally like, there has to be a variety of limitations that you see with people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, how do you approach that? Is it sort of like a feedback loop? Yeah, it's a good question. So typically what I'll do is provide some sort of, you know, intervention, whether that's hands-on therapy or um, prescribing a certain exercise. And then I see how they feel after. So we use what we call a comparable sign. Comparable sign is a motion or a specific movement that reproduces symptoms. So let's say when I have them, you know, do a backwards bend that creates their back pain. What I'll do is some sort of intervention. And then I will have them do that same motion and see if the back pain feels better, worse, or about the same. And that helps guide what I choose to do or send them home with next. When they come in for their second visit, I typically will follow up on the exercises and I'll ask questions about how did you feel with them? We want to make sure they're not too intense. They're not making symptoms worse but typically they should feel either similar or better after they do the exercises. They should not feel worse. I like that. Mm -hmm. Uh Yes. And sometimes I have to give people like soreness rules where it's like, okay, if your symptoms are, you know, more than a three out of 10 when you finish doing the exercises, but it stays at about that or gets better within a couple hours, I'm totally fine with that. If it gets to a five or six out of 10 when you do them, but it goes away pretty quickly after and you're fine by the next day. I am mostly okay with that. But if you're doing exercises and it's super painful, it lingers to the next day, or you feel crappy the next day, but you didn't the day of the exercises, then we typically need to change something. So I really try to get into the nitty gritty of how are you feeling with the things that we're giving you? So they're not likely to just kind of drop off from PT. Yeah, that is. uh... So as a physical therapist and you Mm -hmm. have personal experience, right? In this area. Yeah. Um, when someone walks through your door, mm-hmm. how do you overcome, I don't want to call it skepticism, but like, how do you build sure. the trust that's mm-hmm. required to make sure they want to come back and like be part of the program? Mm-hmm. I think listening is one of the most valuable tools that I have in my, in my toolkit. Um, especially because, I mean, we know the average time to get diagnosed can be years and you can see a multitude of healthcare providers. And so I feel like through my own personal experience, I have just really recognized the value of listening. Sometimes on the first visit, we don't get a whole lot done and I'm okay with that. I really want to know that I develop that therapeutic alliance or rapport with the patient I want them to feel like they can share their full story um, and just kind of share whatever they feel like is important for me to know. And that we kind of develop a good relationship on that first day, because 
if there's not trust and there's not a relationship, it's hard to um, continue with PT or to want to continue. So I just want them to feel heard by the end of the session. Oh, I love that. I think we need, we, we need more of you. Can we clone you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we want to get a little bit into like manual therapy techniques. Mm -hmm. Are there any we can like walk through, can we walk through one or two and yeah. Um, so I feel like I'm going to be doing the, you know, these visual demonstrations and people can't see me, but, um, a couple of the, the main ones I would say, especially with spine. So we do what's called a, like a posterior to anterior mobilization. So essentially the patient's laying on their stomach. I'm putting my hand kind of over their spine and doing gentle oscillations or kind of pressing and letting up, pressing and letting up over their spine. And that's a P to A mobilization. I tend to use those on a lot of patients. Um, they can be helpful because the oscillatory motion is helping move that joint. And when we get motion through a joint, we get the pumping at that joint that's gonna create more fluid distribution and nutrition to kind of get distributed through that joint. And we're also getting some blood flow going too, which at the most basic level, tissues really need oxygen, they need nutrition, they need blood flow, they need movement among other things. And so that's probably one of the primary joint mobilizations that I use. So that may not be recommended at home, right? Yeah, I would say, I would say it's definitely something I've learned in my training. Um, but I've definitely taught a few spouses how to do it, especially if someone's like, I'm going on vacation. That was super helpful. Can you teach my spouse how to do right. that? And I'm like, yes, absolutely. Um, but typically it's something I perform more like in the clinic. And you would get a different effect from like a, if someone was using like a foam roller. Yeah. I, so I try to choose my exercises based on the mobilization or the manual technique that I performed. So if I'm, you know, doing a mobilization that should be helpful for getting them more extension or to be able to bend backwards, I'm going to choose exercises that are going to help reinforce that backwards motion. So we always want to follow up with an exercise, follow an exercise should follow the mobilization technique so that we're not just doing random stuff, but we're trying to like target where we need to be. That puts a lot into perspective, just yeah. like the whole idea of like the exercise follows the technique. Yeah, I sure. think that's really important that I've never heard anyone articulate it that way in my 20 years of physical therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Being patient. Uh, sure. So what do you recommend people? Can they do things at home? Maybe not. I mean, I know the spine is particularly, we want to like probably not recommend people dig into their spines at home. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, without training. Um, mm -hmm. but are there things we can do to like help our joint mobilization at home that's simple and safe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would say general exercises or things that I would as an overarching theme, I would probably say if you're just starting off with doing some mobility exercises or strengthening or cardio, starting slower and with more posturally supported things is going to be more helpful. So um, things laying on your back or things laying on your side are generally going to be better than if you were to just go out and start doing like squats, lunges, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then for cardio, doing things where you're more supported. So maybe sitting on um, like a recumbent bike or an elliptical is going to be low impact or swimming. Those types of things might be helpful. Um, that would be lower impact. Uh, foam rollers, you know, things like that are, are great. I just, I tend to be hesitant to kind of give like a broad, like, oh yeah, everybody should try using a foam roller because sometimes it can be too much depending on how inflamed people are. So you ever use the OOV? No, tell me more about that. Oh, the OOV, I should go pick mine up. Not yeah. that I can see it, but it's it's a uh it's like a in Pilates, they have those like spine correctors, those giant yeah. foam things. Mm -hmm. This is more uh it's gentler, it's softer, but it 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 follows the natural curve of your spine so you can actually like relax into it. That sounds uh, great. Yeah. I, my physical therapist had me get one like 10 years ago. Cause you just, you can lay in it. Like it splays up your, like there's a thinner band up your back and you can just kind of like open up on it. 
Uh, that sounds amazing. No, it, it is amazing. I will, I will, for anyone who doesn't know, there are some, and there's some free like classes. You do have to buy it like a foam roller, but sure. uh, it's really great for people like us. I, uh, at least I've found not to endorse yeah. a specific product, but um, yeah. I don't think there's anything like it in the world. Um, that sounds great. Yeah, it's fun. I'll show it to you before we jump off. Okay. Um, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> maybe we'll put a picture of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it could be the header. Um, so here on Spondycast, we love success stories. Mm -hmm. uh, have you had any really like amazing success stories from patients in your practice that were just maybe not in a great place when they walked through the door and you were able to work toward like a really much better outcome? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have, I can think of one patient in particular. So she, and I, I talked to her a little bit and I asked if I could share a little bit about her story. And uh, she has axial spinal arthritis and has had it for a couple of years. She's about, I think she's 22, 21 or 22. And she had been in PT for quite some time. Um, and once my coworkers had found out that I was diagnosed, they asked if I could, you know, sit down and chat with her. And so we, we went back and forth, you know, just talking about a couple of things on email. And eventually they asked if I could be part of her case so I could work alongside her. And uh, it's been great. She's, she had a hip surgery, which was successful. And she's, you know, having uh, less pain and better function as a result of that. She's had a couple bumps along the way, um, we just with, she's in the middle of kind of changing her meds at this point. Uh, but she's getting back into doing some like coaching, uh, with her softball kiddos and she's about ready to, uh, graduate in the next year or so here and be a teacher. And, um, so she's really responded well to PT and the surgery that she had. And it's been really good to just see where she's at now versus where she was before she, you know, was on medications um, and had had her hip surgery. So she's just in a lot better place right now, which is great. That's amazing. And as you work with people, mm -hmm. I, someone said to me once on about physical therapy, they said, it's like, a, it could be like a lifelong relationship. It's not totally. just, especially when you have something that's ongoing. I mean, I'm always like, well, you know, six months ago it was this, and now I need to go back in for like four sessions for, yeah, yeah. for, for X. So do you, do you generally like uh, work with your patients knowing that it's an ongoing or it could be, Hey, you, you know, you might be released today, but go out there in the world. And if something changes, come back, how do you, do you have patients that come back after time? Totally. Yeah. That's like the really nice thing about working in a community. Now I've been there for, um, almost five years. And so I do get some returning patients, uh, that come back. And the beauty of what I do is I get to educate. I get to help people. I get to educate on how to do things that are going to be helpful long-term for them and to continue working on outside of PT. You know, it's always hard when you're discharging a patient cause you know, you're not going to see them for a while, but I always tell them if something changes in the future, come back. You know, it's so nice to have a provider that you've seen before who knows more of your story, maybe even remembers, you know, a lot about how your joints move or things that were um, challenging before, things that were helpful. Um, and it can just be a great resource to go back to. So I definitely encourage people to come back, um, you know, later on down the road if they have issues again. Yeah, that's awesome. And mm -hmm. uh, do you think that... Uh, what are the like what are the biggest challenges that spondyloarthritis patients face like when it comes to adhering to the regimen? Mhm. Mm physical therapy can be daunting. It can okay. be daunting, totally. Yes. Mhm. Mm I think one of the biggest challenges is if they get exercises that maybe are too much too quick. And I think that's where that communication has to be really open with your PT about how you're feeling with the things you're doing at home and how you're handling the treatment sessions. Because if you're, you know, leaving a treatment session and you're really flared up or you do the exercises and you're like, Oh my gosh, I could barely move the next day. That's way too much. So I think that's important. I think the other thing to consider is 
when patients are performing their exercises. So I usually will ask, is there a certain time of day where you feel like you feel best? And if they say, you know, mornings are really rough for me, I might say, okay, try these two things, or you just get up, you take a hot shower, you know, you try to do what you can, what you know is going to be helpful, and then do your exercises at, you know, 3 or 4 p.m. if that's when they feel better. So I might prescribe that. Um, or for physical therapy treatment sessions, it's not always best to see patients when they're feeling their worst, because sometimes if that inflammation is just too much or they're just too stiff, anything you do for them is not going to be helpful. So I might say, whatever the best time of day is, you come in here, we'll have our PT sessions, and then you can do these things to kind of help manage it when you're not here and you're more flared up. I like that approach. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say that they don't need to see the patient when they're feeling their, like, I mean, that's, but yeah. it makes sense, right? And mm -hmm. we get where it's, it can be very difficult. So, For sure. um, okay, research advancements, mm -hmm. what's new for mm -hmm. us? Yeah. So, I had my rheumatologist send me like the clinical practice guidelines. And um, I wouldn't say that I have read like the nitty gritty, like here are the specific things you should do in PT, but they do, there's good evidence for being in physical therapy with spondyl arthritis and that it can be helpful. Um, there's really, really great evidence that land-based exercise is great for management of the disease. Um, and so those are kind of the, I would say the main, main things that people should know is doing exercise is great for you, but we need to start slow and make sure we're starting at an appropriate level for people. Okay. What does land-based mean? Um, land-based would be uh, anything where you're going to be like walking, um, doing things on land. So not aquatic, like aquatic therapy isn't a bad, I don't think it's a bad place to start, especially, I mean, that's where I started. I couldn't do anything land-based. And so I just swam and swam and swam and swam. <laughs> and that was like my, you know, that was great. Um, but then eventually moving to land-based and essentially that's because, you know, if we see like, even in like an osteoporotic population, they need uh, land-based stuff to help provide more strength. When we get that weight bearing activity, that's going to provide more strength. The more strength we have, the more we can offload those joints and make them happier. So. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Land-based. I, well, I guess I've never thought of it that way. Yeah. Uh, all these fancy words you guys have. I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, okay. So I just know that this is like, this has been a joy because like you, you just have this natural affinity to connect, I think with people. Mm -hmm. um, any closing words of hope or inspiration or encouragement when people are kind of facing down, like taking the first step either toward physical therapy or getting moving again? Mm -hmm. I always tell people just with any, you know, provider, it's like if you were looking for a primary care or you were looking for, um, you know, a mental health therapist or that might be, you want to find someone that you connect with. And so if you go to a PT and you feel like, Hey, this wasn't a good fit for me. You can always try someone else or ask to see someone else. Some personalities just fit better with people than others. Um, I would generally encourage people to see like a physical therapist who maybe sees only one patient at a time. I think in some cases, you know, seeing multiple patients, I'm sure that works. We don't do that in our clinic, but I'm sure that that can work for certain things. But when you've got an underlying autoimmune disease, you want to see one provider so that they can really give you that full undivided attention. And the third thing I would say is don't give yourself grace in where yeah. you start because it might be that 10 years ago, your symptoms weren't as bad and you were running marathons or whatever that might be, but give yourself grace for where you're at and try not to compare yourself to other people. And I think that's really hard. I had such a hard time with that. Um, but if you can start small, remember that if you're doing five minutes of exercise, that's more than five minutes of sitting on the couch. And so just getting up and doing something small is better than nothing at all. So just to encourage people do a little bit see a therapist that can help guide you. Um, and yeah, that would be kind of my three things that I would encourage people. I love that. I love the grace piece. You, yeah. you touched on a, uh, I had a moment a 
couple of weeks ago where I, I've been doing like a variety of different things and then kind of got out mm -hmm. of that loop and was like, I was in that spot of like, do you go back to physical therapy or do you just like push through? And, yeah. uh, and I started strength training again after like a year of just yeah. slacking and mm -hmm. not anything massive, but sure. I showed up at the gym and bumped into a friend of mine who he's there like six days a week or whatever. Right. Like he's, he's constant. Mm -hmm. And I'm there. We're both, we both turned 50 recently and yeah. we're, we're there and I'm doing like my little like 10 pound, you know, like squats and, yeah. uh, and this young 20 something year old girl walks up and just, she was on the bench in between us and just crushing it. Mm -hmm. Man, there's nothing. I mean, he texted me. He's like, there's nothing that could blow your self esteem. Like a really good looking, like 25 year old girl. Who's like, I know. and I said, you know what? Nope. I said, cause I look at those girls and I think, you don't have two teenagers, an autoimmune disease, a company to run, and you just turned 50. Like, come back to me when you're 50 and we'll chat. Like, Absolutely. I'm here, we showed up, and that's all that matters, right? Yes. Different life stage, totally. Absolutely. Yeah, but just, it's, the, it's taking the first step, I think. It and is. No, right? I mean, I, and my journey started, it wasn't strength training. It started hobbling into the pool with a cane. Yeah. And Absolutely. So- mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like to give yourself grace. It makes a huge difference. So yeah, I think so too. I know. And it's even like among people that have, you know, spondylitis, it's easy to look and be like, oh my gosh, like there are people out there running, you know, marathons. And I'm like, I just finished my first 10K a couple of weeks ago. And that was the most I've run, you know, since I started my biologic injections. And, but I still am like, oh my gosh, I could do more. But I just had to sit back and be like, this was a huge accomplishment. I haven't. Mm done this in years. I haven't been able to do this in years without eating, you know, ibuprofen. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it is huge. And I think mm -hmm. we, we forget that like the little things we do add up to. Yeah. And we never know what the person standing next to us has gone through or didn't get done. I mean, for me to get to the gym, I can't like, I can't get laundry done. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, if I'm going to take care of my health, I've canceled the holidays or whatever. Right. Like right. those are things. So exactly. amazing. This was so lovely. I'm so grateful for your time and uh, anything I missed. I don't think so. No, I just feel super yeah. grateful to be here and to be able to contribute and provide information for people. So I love it. So where um, are you like a, you're at the, is it Medros? Kedr Did I say uh, Kepros. Kepros. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So Kepros and Cedar Rapids. Yeah. And yeah, we look forward to having another chat with you soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. SpondyCast was made possible by donations from the Spondylitis Association of America's individual members and our show's corporate sponsor, AbbVie. Since our founding in 1983, the Spondylitis Association of America has been the face, voice, and leading nationwide nonprofit educating, empowering, and advocating for people living with spondyloarthritis. Through our extensive work with patients, the medical community, and partners, we provide information and resources to help people impacted by the disease live better lives and champion research to find a cure.